Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. A campus radio station is going to be in action. An interviewer is interviewing a man from the university for the survey. Listen to the conversation between them and circle the best answer from A, B, or C for questions 1 to 4. You now have some time to read questions 1 to 4. Now, we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will never hear the recording for the second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Excuse me, I'm conducting a campus survey. Would you have time to answer a few questions? What's it all about? We're doing some market research for a new campus radio station starting in the next few months. That's OK. Sounds good. Great. I'll just work through this form with you. And if we could start with some personal background information? Sure. Right. If I could have your age, please. 26. OK, good. And are you a student, teacher or in another job? Well, I'm a tutor, but I'm also a postgraduate student, so I don't know what you might call me. What do you think? OK, well, I'm more of a teacher, really. Fine. And would you mind if I asked about your salary, or I could leave it blank? No, that's OK. It's $20,000 a year. Thanks. Right. Now about your current listening habits. What would you say is your main reason for listening to radio? Well, I'm usually busy during the day at work, so I usually only listen to the radio at night. It helps me relax and unwind, even if I'm studying. Good. And how many hours a day on average do you listen to the radio? Well, not a lot really. I'd say just over an hour all told. Now you have some time to read questions 5 to 10. Now listen to the second part of the interview and answer questions 5 to 10. So, what are the two main times of the day that you listen to the radio? Well, for a little while around breakfast time, and then it tends to be later, after dinner, when I've finished any serious work I need to do. And what sort of radio programs do you like? I like the news, but I also like classical music. It helps me to relax. Fine. And turning to the new campus station, which type of programmes would you prefer? I think the existing radio stations cater for my need for news. So I'd like to see programmes about local information, you know, providing a service to the campus community. And in the same vein, perhaps more for academic viewers, you know, some lectures or relevant programmes. Oh, I see. And if you had to give the new director some specific advice when they set up the station, what would you tell them? I think I'd advise them to be careful about the quality of the broadcasts. You know, the sound system. There are a lot of radio stations and people can change their loyalty quickly if it doesn't meet their needs. I think they should do more of these kinds of interview too, you know, talking with existing and potential customers. Oh, I'm pleased you think it's useful. Certainly, yeah. Good. Now, this station will not be fully funded by the university. So how often do you think it is tolerable to have adverts? I think, well, out of that list I'd say every quarter of an hour. 
Of course, that's providing they don't last for ten minutes each time. Oh, quite. And are you interested in attending any of the special promotions for the new station? Yes, I'd be happy to, as long as they're held on the campus or nearby. Okay, I'll note that down. And finally, may we put you on our mailing list? Well, I prefer not, except for the information about the promotions you just mentioned. Okay, can I have your name and address? Of course, I have a card I can give you. Oh, great! And thanks a lot for your time, and we look forward to seeing you. Yeah, sure.、Mm, thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a conversation between an IELTS candidate and an IELTS administrator. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Good afternoon. I'm applying for a master's program at the University of Exeter in the UK. I'm planning to register for the IELTS exam at your centre next month. I have some questions I'd like to ask you before I register, if that's okay. Certainly. Would you be taking the academic module? I think so, but I'll have to contact the university just to make sure. You'll probably need the academic because most universities don't accept the general training, and anyway, the procedures to register for the exam are the same for both the general and the academic modules. Good. My first question is whether I sit all parts of the exam on the same day. I don't live here, you see. And for me, it would be more convenient to do all the papers on the same day. Hmm. Unfortunately, the speaking part is scheduled for Thursdays, and reading, writing, and listening tests take place on Saturdays. We can't change the days, I'm afraid. Hmm. That's a pity. Well, never mind. What sort of documents do I need to bring in order to register? You'll have to fill in the IELTS application form and bring an ID, a copy of your ID, and two passport-sized photos on a white background. Will any ID do? We only accept original passports and national IDs. That's good to know. Did you say that reading, writing, and listening are scheduled for Saturday? That's right. Will I get a break in between the papers? I'm afraid there aren't any breaks between the papers. Each paper takes an hour to complete, so it's three hours straight through. You'll first do listening, and then reading, followed by the writing test. This is a standard requirement from Cambridge. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions sixteen to twenty. Okay, and how soon after the test can I pick up my results? It takes thirteen calendar days 
for the results to be processed. Can you let me know how much it is and the form of payment? The examination fee is 200 US dollars. You can pay by credit or debit card. We also accept cheques. We only accept cash as a form of payment in exceptional circumstances. And one last question. Can I mail you the application documents? Certainly. You can send all the documents by registered mail to our address. 47 Clover Place, New Rochelle, New York. Could you spell New Rochelle for me, please? Certainly. N E W R O C H E L L E. Could I have the zip code as well? Sure. Our zip code is 10806. Thanks. You can also email us at iinquiry at examsmail.com or phone us at 325-9082. I think that's all. Thank you very much for all the information. Bye. You're welcome. Goodbye. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. I have with me today Matthew East, a registered osteopath and a supporter of alternative techniques in healthcare. Matthew, can you tell us more about osteopathy? First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Over the past 50 years, there have been some radical changes in medicine as it is known in the West. This is largely the result of vast improvements in technology, but also in the rising importance of alternative treatments. I have with me today Matthew East, a registered osteopath and a supporter of alternative techniques in healthcare. Matthew, can you tell us more about osteopathy? Well, perhaps the first thing I should say is that the term alternative is actually a little misleading, as I am referring to approaches and attitudes to health that were in common use long before Western medicine was established. I prefer the term natural. Anyway, I'll begin by telling you a little about osteopathy. Basically, osteopathy is the manipulation of muscles in order to alleviate stresses and tensions that lead to pain. Now, unlike Western medicine, osteopathy considers the whole body, not just the affected area. And this is a very important principle of natural remedies. The whole body must be considered before a course of treatment can be decided upon. You see, the aim of therapies like osteopathy is not only to repair the body, but also to get the body treating itself. And this does not come from treating the symptoms. To give an example, I recently treated a two-month-old baby who was screaming all day and was even worse at night. The couple had taken the baby to their doctor, but the only advice they were given was that the baby would grow out of it. However, the real problem stemmed from a difficult birth, 
which put pressure on the baby's neck. After ten minutes of gentle manipulation, the pressure was released, and within twenty minutes the baby was quiet and calm for the first time. This was achieved without drugs or operations. Avoiding such invasive methods of treatment highlights another of the differences between Western medicine and a more natural approach. You see, Western medicine often uses surgery in order to find a solution to problems that could have been addressed with simple remedies. A medical approach that looks closely at how essential an operation is before it is performed would offer patients a considerably less stressful method of treatment, not to mention the financial savings. Natural remedies actually amount to about 10% of the cost of a Western course of treatment. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. I'd like to mention the subject of surgery again a little later, but I would like to say at this point that there are those that claim that the benefits of osteopathy and herbal therapies are largely psychological, that they have not undergone the clinical trials that pharmaceuticals have. To answer that, you only need to look at the example I gave earlier of the baby that stopped crying less than an hour after treatment, but was obviously far too young to react because of purely psychological factors. Another example can be seen in the successful use of acupuncture in the treatment of animals. In response to criticism regarding clinical trials, it is worth noting that the power of pharmaceutical companies is such that, although some drugs fail the standards required of them, they are sometimes still prescribed by doctors. Moving on to another point, it should be stressed that natural remedies, in addition to having no side effects, can also be applied to any patient. Now, I'm not suggesting that the same treatments are used indiscriminately. Although natural remedies can be used with any age group, the treatment selected is very specific to the person. By this I mean that not only the general health of the patient needs to be considered, but also their habits, diet, and lifestyle in order to build a complete picture. However, I am not suggesting that we should reject Western medicine entirely. In fact, there have been occasions when I have referred patients to their doctor, as I felt that in those cases it was the most suitable course of action. There are many situations in which it is by far the best option. Take emergency surgery, for example. Obviously, more natural remedies do not provide the speed required in such cases. The best solution would therefore be an open-minded combination of the two forms. Well, thank you very much, Matthew. That was a very interesting insight into alternative, sorry, natural treatments. Next week, we'll be inviting Dr. Moore. That's M O O R. E, onto the programme to argue his case as a doctor. Until next week then, goodbye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. I've asked you here just to remind you about this Friday's field trip. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. OK, I'd like to keep this meeting as brief as possible as I'm sure we all have things to do. I've asked you here just to remind you about this Friday's field trip. This is the first of many field trips you'll be going on, so there are a few rules I'd like to make clear now. Most importantly, I want you all to remember that simply because you are leaving the college does not mean that you are not studying. This is an essential part of your course and should be treated as such. There will be two assignments for you to complete whilst you are there and some extension work you will be expected to do over the weekend, so I suggest you all pay attention on the day. Moving on, remember that we are going to a salt marsh and must dress appropriately. High-heeled shoes and t-shirts are not what I consider appropriate. You need good footwear, preferably boots, and you should bring a waterproof jacket as the weather is unpredictable. It would also be a good idea to bring a change of clothes. There is a chance you will get wet, and a three-hour return journey in damp clothes is nobody's idea of fun. We will be on the marsh from about 10 o'clock to about 4, so you will be given a light lunch. However, if you want to bring any snacks with you, then please feel free to do so, although we will be stopping for dinner on the way home. Now this is the fourth time the college has been to Park Drive Salt Marsh, and so far we have never lost a student. <laughs> However, remember that there are 28 people going, and if you are late, you will be keeping myself and your colleagues waiting, and at that time in the morning you will not find me very forgiving. Please try to arrive a few minutes before 7. If you are not here on the hour, you risk being left behind. For those of you who are being collected in the evening, you can expect to be back here between 8.30 and 9pm. But do warn whoever may be coming for you that the traffic is unpredictable and it may well be later. Before you go, I'll hand out your assignment papers and briefly explain what you have to do. Now, on the first page, all you are required to do is identify the flora and fauna on the page and find an example in the salt marsh. As I told you on Monday, you will need a camera for this. I recommend one of those disposable cameras rather than something more valuable, as the marsh can get very dirty. Now on page 2, you will be looking more at the bird life on the marsh. You should be able to see what you have to do for this assignment, but there will be plenty of time on the way there to ask any other questions. Well, we'll stop there and I'll see you all on Friday morning. Oh, before you go, just a word of caution. The plants are there to be seen and photographed only. Remember that this is a protected site and we will have to get permission for this trip. If there are any problems, we may not be allowed to go again and you will be spoiling the opportunity for other students. OK, if you have any questions, come and see me later today or tomorrow. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.